from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me Michael Armstrong. Michael, he's a CTO and uh, I like to keep it for himself to introduce <laughs> what uh, he does and his company. So, Michael, thank you again for being on the show with me today. Can you please tell us a bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, just uh, looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, so my name is Mike Longstrong. I'm a Chief Technology Officer at Authentics. Um, we are, well, it depends on who you ask. Whether you ask me or our CEO, but uh, um, we are a, we're in the customer experience space. So we really focus on customer and patient experience. Um, and, and it's really the intelligence, it's the insights uh, that we can glean from conversations, right? So our philosophy is really like your, your patients, your customers, they're telling you what, the, what your problems are. They're telling you what you can improve. Uh, you know, they're telling you where the, where the friction is. Uh, you just got to listen to them. You just got to listen to them. Uh, you know, so not, that's really kind of the, the, the business uh, focus that we take is, is, is really trying to understand this and, and helping uh, clients solve these problems and understand this. Of course, we use a lot of AI because we do this at scale, right? Like massive, massive scale. Uh, you know, yeah. so of course, AI has to be a part of our strategy. Great, great. And thank you again, Michael, for being here today. So the way I like to do it, and because we talk the same language, um, so from a CTO perspective, um, and, you know, as a company and you as, as a, uh, someone who, who works on the technology side of it, I'm sure that you spotted some problems, right? And you mentioned, you know, a couple of them, but what was really, you know, the, the pain, you know, that you tried to solve um, with Authentics and uh, CX. And, you know, what triggered also, you know, like you said, right, like this is something we need to, to, to fix because it's, it's causing a lot of problems. So if you can share this with us um, and elaborate more on it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we, yes, yeah, so what we saw, we a couple things. Um, first off is, uh, you know, healthcare, if you're familiar with healthcare in the U.S., uh, it's expensive. Uh, the, the, the care is, is really, uh, it's, it's been evolving in, in a way that's really not, uh, really beneficial to patients. Uh, you know, so, so the care is decreasing, the costs are increasing. Uh, there's a lot of different people in, in the mix and it's just really complex. Like it's a really complex problem. Uh, mm -hmm. and at the same time, we also, we also observe, uh, a lot of companies, you know, they, they're, they're putting focus and, and um, energy into customer experience and patient experience, uh, but, but they don't really have a great way to sort of, uh, understand the problem set. There's a lot of surveys, right? I'm sure, I'm sure you've seen a lot of surveys, things like NPS, right? Uh, net promoter score, uh, is a yes. big, uh, you know, co very common thing we see all the time. Right. Uh, and we looked at that and, and, and there, of course there's a lot of problems with surveys, right? There's self-selection and various biases. Um, and then on top of that, like, you know, you, 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 there's not much rich context there. Uh, and, and what we saw, um, from, um, from call centers and, and various recordings, you know, every company has thousands of these conversations going on with their customers, with their patients every day. And they record it. Like everything's recorded, right? I'm sure you've heard the, uh, Hey, this is going to be recorded for quality assurance and that kind of thing. Right. And a large percentage of companies just like, they, they, it just goes off into the archives. <laughs> You know, so they don't actually do a whole lot with it, right? But it's an, an incredible resource, uh, you know. So, and, and so our actually our CEO was working. Our CEO, Amy Brown, uh, she was running a call center. You know, she's like she was a COO um, running a call center of a, you know, I think it was a health insurance company at the time. Uh, you know, and she and she of course saw this firsthand, day in and day out. That um, you got a lot of problems, but your customers are telling you what they are. The customers are telling you 
what they need. They, they're, they're telling you where they're stuck, where the problems exist. Uh, if you just listen, if we would just listen to that, um, you know, we, it, it would be, you know, you can make ma major changes. And so that's, that's kind of where we, where we started was that insight, um, of the problem and, but the answer is there if, if you just listen to it, uh, you know, so that, that's kind of the, a little bit about the origin story there. Yeah. Great. Now you mentioned at the beginning, and of course, because now this has became more logical, you said you, we use a lot of AI and the reason is you have a lot of data sets, but first let's understand a little bit about the domain specific AI. So like what domain specific AI is and how it's dif di different from general other AI models. Yeah. Well, that's, that's an interesting question. And, um, you know, just like, well, just like AI in general, this is, this is evolving. Uh, I'm sure you, I'm sure you've observed that, it, you know, AI has evolved very rapidly, uh, particularly this year. Um, you know, I've heard, I've heard the comment that, well, AI just started working six months ago, right? Like, <laughs> like, like when, when chat GPT three came on, it was like, uh, now we have like AI that works. Um, but domain specific AI really starts from the understanding that right now, um, as a company, right, if, if you're trying to build a company around AI or, or AI is a big part of your moat, let's say, uh, well, you have to realize that AI is kind of a, it's a commodity, right? Uh, like whatever I, the algorithms, the code that I have access to, everybody has access to in general, right? There's just so much really, really good open source, uh, that it's, it's essentially just, an, it's just a commodity. And so we look at that and we say, well, um, if we're going to compete on that, what does that mean? What does that look like? And so there's really two different, two different areas that we can focus on in a domain space. Um, one is your training data, right? So if you have a unique set of data, uh, you know, that you can, you can train these models on, well, that, that gives your models this, this unique ability, unique, uh, sort of insight in, in, into what, what you're analyzing. And so that's a really big for us, that's a big part of our mode. And that's really what, that's a big part of what the domain AI looks like is, is you're training it on very specific problems. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so that, that's really where we focus in. Yeah. Now you, we talked about, you know, the call center part of it and the application of the call center, but it's there like, you know, and you talked about CX, which is basically in this case, it's the patient experience, right? So can, can you highlight some real world examples on, on how this could facilitate maybe the communication? Is it something that, you know, um, will make the diagnosis, you know, process easier? Like what are exactly the use cases? I'm interested, you know, it's very, you know, and I was on the website actually on, on your website and I saw like really some cool stuff over there, but I want to hear that directly from you, Mike. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So. Well, so we, you, we, right now we focus in three, the three big verticals. So we focus in on, on pharma, uh, payers and providers. And even, even within healthcare, we narrow this, this domain specific AI even more. So we might look at, um, payers or, or providers and say, well, um, you know, we need to build a model to, to sort of solve this problem. And so we, we even, we even sort of stratify it at an even finer level, generally speaking. Um, but I'll give you, I'll give you a really good example of, of how we utilize AI and, and keep in mind that the, for us, the volume of data, like the scale of the data is, 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 is huge. We, we process terabytes, uh, every week, uh, of data, you know, so we're talking about hundreds of thousands of, um, audio files, potentially chat files, things like that. So it's, the scale is pretty, you know, pretty, pretty big. Um, but one really, here's a really unique model that that we've developed that's really um, useful or really interesting. Uh, if you're familiar, if you're familiar with a, a, an eddy in a river, uh, you ever spent much time on rivers or anything like that? No. <laughs> Not really. Okay. Well, so so we have so the, it's kind of a it's kind of a slang term, I guess you could say. But um, if when a, a river is flowing and there's a large boulder in the river or a large log in the river, and and the flow of the water uh, is disrupted, right? So instead of flowing down river. Uh, that water is, uh, you know, begins to sort of swirl or pool, right? And it's no longer able to move down, down river as it, as it should. Uh, well, that's called an eddy. Uh, mm -hmm. so we recently developed this, this concept of an eddy effect. And really what it is, is it's about friction, 
right? It's, it's about, you, you ran into a problem. You're trying to get, let's say, a procedure approved or paid for, uh, you know, or you're trying to figure out, um, you know, what, what's the process, uh, you know, for, for a billing payment or, or something like along those lines. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's where this, this, what we call an eddy effect comes into play. Uh, so we have, we have a model we've developed uh, for, for the past couple of years that'll tell us, hey, this, this conversation includes an eddy, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so we can know like, hey, we've got friction. So we have clients that measure their eddy effect rate uh, across time, right? And so they're looking at this as, well, in a way they're looking at it as a replacement of NPS. Um, within this, within this healthcare space. Um, and, and that model itself is actually pretty interesting because, um, it's pretty, it's actually pretty well generalized across all the verticals. Uh, you know, so at this point it, it understands how people talk about, uh, their problems, right? Like how they talk about, Hey, I'm stuck here. I can't find an answer, uh, those kind of things. And so that's, that's sort of a really foundational model for us. Um, some, you know, foundational AI, because we can determine like, Hey, 20% of your interactions with patients have significant friction in them, for mm. example, right? Just as our starting point. Uh, and then for us, we can, we, we build on top of that. And again, we're very, like we use AI in a really sort of really specific way where we're, we're trying to solve really specific problems. And, and so we might then say, well, Hey, within these 20% of, uh, of calls of interactions, we have any, uh, you know, here are the things we're talking about. Right. And so you can then narrow it down one step further and say, okay, uh, you know, what processes do we have that really generate a lot of friction and a lot of problems with patients and clients? Um, yeah, so that's, you know, that's really foundational for us as far as how we approach this problem. Um, another one more example for you sure. of, of like really specific model that we've that we've built is uh, what's known as safety events or adverse events. Right. So in pharma, of course, um, indicating an adverse event is a pretty big deal. Uh, right where where it needs to be uh, captured and reported, um, and so we we have you know we have a model that can that can identify that hey we've got a patient that's talking about an adverse event in this conversation, um, and then mm -hmm. of course we actually have a follow up model that indicates did your agent did your customer uh, you know representatives did they acknowledge that like did they say oh okay well I better capture this information here so um, you know we're really tackling not just um, you know, uh, vertical specific AI, but we're also like problem specific AI that we're really zero in on. And, and you know, one of the reasons we do that is just like, you know, AI fundamentally is probabilistic, right? Like it's, it's, it's always the best guess. And for us, that's not, you know, that doesn't quite get it done in the healthcare space. You know, like you have to have the right answer. And so we, we take something that's sort of fundamentally probabilistic and we try to make it as deterministic as we can. Right, like it, it has to give us the right answer, um, our, our, because that's what our clients demand, of course, but also just the space we're in. Um, we have to minimize, uh, you know, any of that wiggle room. Yeah, and of, of course, like because you in healthcare, it's like something that touched people's lives, uh, so it have to be deterministic, of course. Now you mentioned something about you know the data sets, and of course, like this is something we, we try even to explain it to to enthusiast about AI and to your point, like AI is not chat GPT that, that came out uh, at the end of last year. So it's all about the data and, you know, um, storing the data and cleaning the data. So what I'm interested to know from you, Michael, is um, like data set creation, right? So so for you, I know like one, one part of it is the conversations that happens, you know, during maybe calls, right? So now, how, you know, for healthcare specific AI models, this creation is, is important and how, you know, you can maintain and ensure that it key, it stays relevant and useful. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And of course, of course, I'm sure you've seen, there's, there's lots of interesting experiments done with chat GPT where you get some, you know, you can really sort of get weird answers out of it, right? Like uh, <laughs> very inconsistent and, and things like that. Um, you know, and, and, and so that's a hard problem. Uh, but, so, but we've made a pretty big investment in actually, um, developing and generating our, uh, data set. And so for us, it's like, it's not just the conversation that's a part of the data set. It's also the labels, right? So we label, uh, we, we actually have a team of healthcare professionals, 
um, that we've hired their own staff. And what they do is um, they're really focused on, on in fact, labeling um, various interactions uh, for us. And so, um, you know, through this exercise, we've, we've really generated this, this big set of data that we can train our models on. And, you know, it's not just labeling. So, so yeah, we, we hire people who, who know the space, they understand the context. Um, but then we're very rigorous about calibrating. You know, we have like you know, very regular sessions where we're, we're calibrating on, you know, what is an eddy? What does an eddy sound like? And, and we're looking at examples and, and we're adjusting and, and we're tweaking. And so for us, like, that labeled data set is, is like really, is really critical and, and a part of what we consider to be like a really unique um, uh, asset really for us. You know. Yeah. So what are the challenges in, in, in this process, Michael? I don't think that comes top of mind is maybe privacy, right? Privacy of the data. So what other challenges you, you have when you do this? Oh yeah, I mean, privacy is a big deal. Uh, privacy, data security, um, those are all really critical items. Um, for us, it, it's, you know, we're a, we're a, let's say a younger company. We started uh, in 2018, um, but that was also an advantage uh, because just from day one, we built everything encrypted all the time. Uh, you know, we use nothing but modern technology. And so I know, you know, we, there's, there's other, uh, let's say competitors in the space, especially in the NLP space, who have maybe been around a little bit longer. It's a little bit, you know, a little more difficult problem for them, but you know, we have some pretty strict rules about everything being encrypted. Uh, we have different teams actually that have been certified to listen to specific data. We've also put a lot of uh, effort into actually redacting uh, PHI, like, you know, personal health information. And so mm -hmm. um, that's actually a part of our process. So we have a pretty extensive, like, data processing process. And, and really, one of the first steps is just to redact anything we don't need. You know, so, so that, that's actually just built into our process is just, um, you know, just eliminating anything that might sort of cause a problem or, or has the potential to cause a problem. And, that, and that's not easy, especially when you're talking about a conversation, right? You're talking about very unstructured data. Um, that in and of itself is, a, is, you know, is a challenging problem. Um, but, you know, we also put a lot of development work into, into the reduction as well. Yeah. Now, one thing that, you know, also I noticed, uh, you know, when I was exploring and preparing. So, of course, like, you know, from industry perspective, uh, you, you explained that. So it's like, you know, farmer comes into the picture in addition to, to, to you know, the hospitals and uh, health providers. But from use case and role perspective, you know, I've seen, you know, in addition to, to patient experience, let's call it, so I've seen like marketing and operations. So, so how, how that works exactly? Yeah, well, that's a good question. So one of the things, we, we look at the, the conversation as um, this like multi-purpose, really rich data set. Right. And so out of a single conversation, the, the, the things that we can extract out of that begin with like the agent quality. So that's sort of, that's just like the baseline. We can assess how well did the agent do? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's, and that's kind of where a lot of companies are today, as far as the maturity, their, their maturity is they want to assess how well did our agent do? Um, but there's a lot more there than just the quality, right? There's, there's the customers, there's a lot to be gleaned about uh, your brand, for example, like, like, well, how do they think about your brand? How do they feel about your brand? Uh, you know, so that's something that marketers are very interested in. Um, if there's, if we're hearing brand detractors or, uh, you know, something along those lines, if you're a marketer, you want to hear that straight from your customer. You don't have to go do a survey if your customers are already telling you. Um, and of course, you know, we, we, we can extract that information as well. Uh, and then from an operational standpoint, you know, we hear about process problems. You know, mm -hmm. in fact, in fact, process problems are, uh, the majority, like I'm trying, so we just did a study actually, um, we presented, we had our first, uh, our first conference a couple of weeks ago called voices, uh, you know, and so, um, we presented a study at that conference and I don't remember the exact number, um, but it was a pretty big majority of the problems of the eddies we, that are indicated are related to process problems, right? So if you're in operations. Uh, you can, you can hear straight from the customer, the process problems that are, that exist and, and that they're really running into causing a lot of friction. Yeah. So Michael, a few uh, moments ago, you mentioned about, you know, 
when when you do the training, you use label labeling, you know, which is done by people who are experts, so they can put their and you know, and like labeling for people who are not familiar. It's kind of classification, if you want, or mm-hmm. you put a tag like this is the this is that this is this. So, but what else? You know, I'm I'm you know AI trainings. When when I hear training, so this is the ultimate goal. Sometimes, uh, you know, is is to enhance the overall results, right? So. Does it go into a way where you want it to be kind of a, and excuse me because I'm not like an AI fully expert in this, but I know like there's a, a, a way where you go with the supervised learning model and then there's the unsupervised learning model. So is this something that you do so the, the, the algorithm or the AI can by itself goes and learn new things? Or you need to keep feeding it with data and then, you know, rely on, on the labeling for getting it better. Yeah, well, so I think the answer to that is uh, yes. <laughs> uh, well, at, at least from our standpoint, we look at, we look at every, every problem and say, hey, what's the best way to approach this? So we, we actually use um, uh, supervised models, like, like you suggested, where you have a label, right? So you have an input you ha- and you have that sort of output label that allows you the machine to learn from, right? So you can, you know, and sometimes a lot of what we'll do is we might clip a little part of a conversation, let's say a 10 second clip. And we say, Hey, um, this, uh, in fact, this is one of the things we're working on right now. Uh, this is frustration. This is what frustration sounds like. This is the words, this is the tone, those, those kind of things. Uh, and, and, and so that would be a supervised, uh, approach, a supervised model. We also have. Uh, algorithms that are unsupervised, where we're doing things like, um, you know, various cluster analysis, looking for different different topics that might exist, might show up, right? Like we're looking for those those latent patterns, um, but we're letting the machine find it, right? Like so that's that would be an unsupervised type of approach. And of course, we've actually had a we like we released our first uh, language model two years ago. So our first language model was actually uh, summarizing calls, and that's a self supervised model. Right. So you, do, so you develop a language model by, uh, well, self supervised, but really what it is, what it's doing, it's, it sort of drops out a word, it predicts it, it says, Hey, did I get it right? You know, and so that's, that's the self supervised approach. And, um, and even, you know, so, so the, we, we take all, like we use all three of those approaches. Um, but then we're always, you know, retraining, whether it's like a reinforcement learning type of approach. Um, as we develop additional data, um, you know, the more the model can see and, and, and understand what the label is when it sees or hears this specific situation, right? The smarter it gets, the better it gets, the more generalized it gets, right? Um, and, yeah. and so that, that's a process that we, that we work on just really regularly. You know, like our Eddy effect model, I think we just released version three of that. Uh, and so for us, it's, it's a continuous improvement. Um, sort of process. Uh, it's not automated yet. Uh, we've considered that, but as you've seen with chat GPT, um, it's a double-edged sword if you automate uh, human feedback uh, into the loop. So um, <laughs> right, as of right now, it's, uh, you know, my, my ML engineers are going, they do a little bit of analysis on the, on the feedback data before, before we just say, hey, this is the right answer. Go ahead and learn from us. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so Michael, you know, I mean, I, I tried to follow a, a sequence to reach to, to this question. Now, as CTOs, you know, and uh, uh, even as consultants, because I was a consultant myself. So when we talk about a new technology or, you know, when, when we try actually to solve a problem with a technology that we develop or we, we acquire or whatever. So we talk about metrics, right? So we talk about, you know, how the business is going to be getting benefits. So from your point of view, when your customers or any customer, I mean, in, in this space, adopt this technology, like what are, let's, I would say, in the short term result that they start to see and on the long run, what are also the benefits they, they see deploying, um, you know, this technology? Oh, yeah, uh, that's a good question. So usually our clients, so there's, there's, there's a maturity curve. Um, because again, this is, this is not a space that's real common. You know, a lot of enterprise, uh, companies have, you know, they have talent and they have, they have experience with structured data 
uh, and maybe they have data warehouses, they have BI systems. Um, and, you know, we're generating a, a lot of intelligence, um, kind of similar to BI, but it's from, from this unstructured data. It's from, it's from these conversations. And so it's very new usually to, um, to our clients. A lot of them start with just, Hey, I want to assess the quality of my agents, right? I want to score the agents. I want to, and I want to coach them. Like this is, that's a big part of it is, is the action that comes out of um, the intelligence that comes out of the AI and the, and the structured data we're, we're generating. And so one of the very first use cases you see is, is that uh, an improvement in the quality scores, you know, so, so a lot of times agents are assessed on several different skill sets and, and, you know, just first of all, just by measuring, um, the skill set, you, you start to see some improvement, right? And then one of the things we built in, and this is actually part of our philosophy is if, if we're going to build AI, we're going to build intelligence. We don't want to do it just because it's neat. You know, even though that's, that's fun for some of us nerds, like we just like technology, uh, but it, it has to be something we can act on. And so one of those things we, we built in is this, this agent coaching, um, capability. Uh, and so what you see is you begin to see those quality scores really improve, uh, as your agents are being measured and they're being coached and they're seeing specific examples of, Hey, he, this would be a better, better way to handle that. Or this is, this is the answer or. You know, uh, you, you can you can maybe find gaps in your training and things like that, and that's usually what you really see really early on after you've implemented our software and begun begun to sort of utilize the program. Uh, mm -hmm. And and then as you grow in your sophistication, you start tracking things like like Eddy effect. You start tracking it like you you might track an NPS score, uh, you know, and you want to follow that that trend, uh, you know, and, and begin to understand. Okay, well. Where, where are my process problems? And you begin to work on your process problems too. Mm -hmm. And you can track your Eddie score, your Eddie effect score and, 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 and as really like, hey, uh, let me see what the trend is and let's see how this is, this is changing. Uh, you know, we've actually, we've had clients actually too, where uh, maybe they've had, uh, you know, um, a new product launch and they want to know like, what are people talking about? Like they just want to know what they're talking about. What are the topics? What are, what's coming up? You know? And so mm -hmm. we see a lot of that, a lot of that coming up too. And to, to the point where um, we've had clients, you know, taking, you know, printing reports out of our system, taking it to the CEO uh, once a week, you know, taking it to board meetings, just because they want to know, like, like, what are, what are your clients? What are they talking about? Um, what are your patients talking about? Um, what are the problems? And so it, it can be really powerful from that standpoint. Um, and actually, Mehmet, did you, I don't know if you saw on our website, we have something that's kind of unique. We call this the montage builder. Did you, did you see that at all? Yes, I saw that. Okay. Yeah. So I know this is about AI, but this is a really interesting thing for, because if you're in, if you've been in the, like the data space, you've probably been in a situation where you see something that's like you've done an analysis and you see this data that's really compelling, right? And you want to share it with somebody else because you want to act on it, right? Like you want to say, hey, here's a problem. Let's go and prove it. But yeah, you but you can't get any traction, right? So I don't know if you've ever experienced that or, you know, uh, seen something like that. It's amazing, actually. I, you know, when, uh, by the way, I have to, to, to say something that like, uh, you designed actually the website in a way that it's hooking. Like, although like I'm, I'm not, I don't work in healthcare. I yeah. work with them a lot, but I mean, like, it's something that really uh, touches people's life and actually the experience itself and it's all what about you do so the experience because you know the frustration when you try even to book maybe an appointment with the doctor and you know when they let you wait on the line or maybe you are checking uh, you did some tests and you want to see the results and you know because mm -hmm. something we do from time to time at all of us and when you mm -hmm. see this how you can enhance the whole process uh, it's really fascinating. Now, you mentioned a couple of things regarding the, inf the existing infrastructure, right? And the existing system. So, unstructured data. Oh, my God. Like, it's one of my, <laughs> my favorite topics, like unstructured data. We'll not discuss the technical details. But, I mean, like, how easy or do you, do you see it as a challenge to integrate your solution or maybe any AI solution with existing infrastructure and existing uh, other software, because you mentioned data lakes, you mentioned maybe they are using some data analysis tools. So how easy is this, I would say, exercise to integrate something similar to your solution or, and, or AI in general yeah. From, yeah, that, existing, from existing uh, setups? Yeah, that, no, that's a great question. And well, so let's just like, just start with just the AI in general. I think um, we've been using this term lately. I don't, I don't know if this is offensive, but 
I, it just kind of describes the, some of the conversations and uh, we've kind of referred to, to a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of people talk, looking to buy software as, as kind of AI drunk, right? Like they're just like, yeah, I got to have AI, right? Like, and, and the question of course is like, well, okay, well, what are you going to do with it? What, you know, what's the problem you're trying to address or how's it going to help you? And, and that's what we, you know, we try to really focus on that. And I think right now it, it's, it's really challenging, right? Because there's, there's so, it's like, you gotta, you gotta work your way through the hype and you gotta figure out, okay, where, where does it shift? It's, this isn't a solar board. You know, it's, it's not like a, a magic wand kind of situation. You, it, it, it is powerful, but, but where does it fit? You know, how can you use it? And so just, just from that point, we have, we do a lot of education. Uh, and I, and I, you know, I'm sure there's other, you know, other AI companies running into the same thing, um, because there's just so much hype around it. So that's a challenge. Um, and then for us, the additional challenge on top of that is just the unstructured data. You know, we've got to get a hold of, uh, call recordings out of systems where they're like, I, you know, they've been maybe storing it for, for decades and, but, but nobody really has the knowledge of where, where it even exists. Right. And so, uh, we, we spent, you know, we've a pretty significant, uh, of professional services where we, where we help clients figure it out and you know, we help them figure out like, where is this data? How do I integrate it? Uh, but then also, of course, you know, how do I climb that learning curve? Well, I've made this big investment. How do I get the benefit out of it? Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it is, I mean, the truth is it's pretty challenging to figure it out. Everybody, everybody wants it. They just, they're not sure what it is. You know. <laughs> exactly. By the way, like I had the, uh, like another, uh, AI company and you know, uh, they they, uh, they they were facing the same challenge when they talk to the customer and they say okay like we have this AI and the customer's first question okay where is your chat GPT interface because now you know everyone thinks like when we talk about AI okay where is the chat interface and you know it's yeah. not about the chat interface but I think customers slowly slowly I mean especially enterprise customers they they start to get yeah, like it's not only about the chat. Yeah, it's good. If it's a good functionality to be able to extract data from the large language model. But I mean, it's it's not like the whole thing. This is like just the interface. This is the the, the top of the iceberg, I would say. And there's a lot of work that that happens, you know, underneath that that needs to be taken care of. And yeah, good luck with extracting the data from from the unstructured data platforms over there. Like it's something really, it's a hard exercise, but it's not. Impossible, <laughs> I would say. So now you are in this space, Michael, and uh, you know what? What? What are you know the? I would say it's maybe like a traditional question, but what are you know the trends you are seeing in in that space in in the healthcare uh, and AI machine learning space? Like what? What? What other use cases you're seeing uh, happening? Yeah, well, so so a couple other use cases, um, and these actually would be really good use cases for large language models is um, just be able to answer questions. Uh, you know, and I, I think this is still really, um, you know, not not very mature at all. But uh, you know, so many patients and 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 customers like they just have a question they need an answer to, um, and oftentimes that question is it's a simple question, but the answer is kind of complex or. It requires a, a pretty detailed set of, uh, of knowledge around your policies, your protocols, um, and, and not even necessarily like, like health knowledge or, you know, it's just like, what are the rules, you know? Uh, and, and so I think that's, uh, that's an area that I would see like, you know, just ancillary to my space that I'm focused on. That would be, uh, just, just right for AI to really be beneficial. Um, we are hearing a lot of talk from, from clients that they think, uh, they think AI can replace their call centers. They can replace all their agents, replace all their call centers. Uh, I, I, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't be in that camp. I, I think, I think people still want to talk to people, you know, especially in healthcare, especially when you're talking about your health, you're talking about, well, in, in a lot of cases, you're even talking about life or death. You want to talk right. to another human being. And so I, I don't, I don't think that's, that's the situation we're in, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk about it of just replacing humans and how, how can you replace people? Um, that's not really, we come down, we really come down on a, how can we augment it? How can we make the experience better? How can we augment humans? How can we help them do their job better? Um, but, but there's a lot, there's a lot of talk of, of, of replacing people right now. 
Yeah, but I have, you know, we discussed also this on the show and especially in the healthcare, like I asked the question, are we going to see even, you know, AI replacing physis physicians? No, of course not. But, you know, it will empower, you know, whoever is using this technology. And I'm a fan of, you know, being AI powered, I would say. So I'm just thinking now of a use case. So if, if someone is scoring and, you know, there are these results that are written by uh, an MD, you know, mm -hmm. and describing, you know, what the results are. And usually they are very scientific. So maybe using the AI, the agent can use the AI to translate this into, as we say, the layman terms to the, to the, the patient, like, hey, you know, that means blah, 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 you know, in, in a very more yeah. simple way. So maybe, yeah. maybe it's, maybe it's a, a use case. Uh, yeah. I, I see it. Um, yeah, and replacing, yeah. But unfortunately, like some of the jobs would be replaced, like there's no, um, no escape from that. But uh, it's about elevating, you know, the scales and getting, you know, to, to, to the next level. Now, as we are coming almost to the end, Michael, like I want to, to ask you something regarding being a CTO in this space, like how it's different from being a CTO in any other space and what advice you, you give for someone, you know, uh, he or she might be interested in going this direction that you went, like any, any hints or tips you, you would give. Yeah, that's well, so we, <laughs> for some reason, we decided to find one of the hardest spaces to tackle. Um, so we're not just in healthcare. We're also tackling the, uh, we sell them to the biggest enterprises in healthcare. Uh, I, was, yeah. I was actually just at our summit last week with other founders. And I think almost everyone said, well, we're avoiding enterprise. We're in small business or, me, you know, in the medium. Uh, company space and uh, we've got well that, that's not us we're like what's the hardest possible thing we can go after I think we might have found it um, you know and and one of the things that's really been beneficial for us is um, to go in with with, with and be very security minded uh, so we put a lot of effort in, into data security and privacy and you know as, as we're you know working through um, you know, the security quest questions and the assess security assessments from each one of our clients. You know, we, we also get the feedback like, like, hey, that was the easiest, uh, you know, assessment we've done. And, and it's because we put a, a lot of effort and thought into it. Uh, you know, I, I've got uh, my security guy, Ken, Ken Gouch, is just, he's all over this. You know, he's just, he just loves his stuff. He's just, he's just awesome at it. And so, but that's really been a bit of an advantage. And so I think if you really want to get into this space, it's not necessarily the fun part of it. You know, I know for me, like, I'm all about like, I want to, I want to talk to my email engineers. I want to talk to my app engineers. You know, that's the fun, that's the fun stuff, but, um, get, get your day security, right. You know, just, just from the beginning, um, just, just make it so that it's not an issue. Uh, and that'll definitely smooth the way, um, you know, it may not be the fun stuff, but, but make it happen and you'll get in better shape. Yeah. yeah cool. Like I know, I think it's a very. Uh, valid uh, advice of it. And if you're passionate about it, go for it, you know, whether it's this space or any other space. It's what I tell even, you know, uh, entrepreneurs and founders that, that they come to me sometimes. So, um, uh, Michael, is there anything that I should have discussed, asked, and I missed? Uh, you know, there's only one other thing I wanted to add is just, you know, we've talked a sure. lot about AI and we've talked a lot about data. Um, one of the things we're actually really careful about, especially in customer experience space, is um, you know we're look we're, we're generating data, we're generating you know output from AI, uh, but we always sort of lead our customers back to the to the literal voice of the customer. We want them to hear the patient. We want to hear. We want them to hear what the patient or the customer has to say. We want them to hear that you know that might be frustration or, or pain in their voice. So even though our AI is telling you X. There's just no replacement for actually hearing it for yourself. And so um, at the end of the day, for us, it's all about like, it, we, we want to be really careful about not dehumanizing by using AI, right? We, we want to make sure we're still focused on the human beings that are involved in this process. And so I guess that's, that's something I want to share, but also just, I would encourage others who, who really want to be in this space, especially from a healthcare perspective, uh, is, is just... You know, don't don't lose sight of that, that that sort of human aspect of it. Yeah, hundred percent, Michael. And thank you for bringing this uh, in. And because we discussed, you know, when we talked, we I I had some uh, episodes just dedicated for customer experience and uh, 
you know, also which mix sometimes with the digital transformation mm -hmm. uh, thing. And we said that you should not usually rush to implement any technology, whether it's AI or any other technology, because especially in call centers, we heard like horror <laughs> stories about, you know, when they put bots and, you know, mm -hmm. Customers were frustrated because they were not able to to talk to a human, and you know they were all, all what they were getting is okay. If you have this, press one. If you have this, press two. Press three, and it's like uh, it's a knock. <laughs> There's no escape from that, and they had to 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 get frustrated. And yeah, uh, it's a very uh, valid advice. And thank you for bringing this, Michael. So, um, Michael, when we can find more about you and about uh, your company. Yeah, we uh so we, yeah, you can check us out on at authentics.com. Uh we've got a lot of stuff uh out there, a lot of case studies. Um it's pretty interesting. Um of course I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, so you can find me there. Um I don't I don't really I don't tweet a lot. Uh, uh Amy Brown, our, our CEO tells me that I'm I'm too provocative. So I try to be a little bit uh, uh careful about about that. So yeah, okay. that's completely fine. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I will make sure that all you know the the you know the links uh, the, the company uh, website is, is in the show notes, of course. And if someone uh, wants to connect with you, and if anyone has even question to Michael, uh, you know you can send to me. I, I will pass it to to Michael. Michael, very much for you know the time and for being on the show. It was really informative we saw today a different uh, i would say or let's say we looked at a different angle from the customer experience slash ai which is mainly for the domain that you serve which is you know healthcare insurance mm -hmm. companies and so on and even like use cases which are guys i advise you to go and check because this is something you know i didn't maybe uh, discuss it before enough you know about the patient experience which is very important uh, and it touched all of us. So cool stuff. Um, again, uh, thank you, Michael, for being here today and for the audience. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for sending your feedbacks, your questions. I really appreciate that. If you're interested also to be a guest on the show, don't hesitate. Reach out to me. We can arrange for that as well. If you have a cool idea, you have a cool thing you want to discuss. And yeah, thank you very much and see you soon. Bye-bye. Hit that subscribe button. Share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.